for joining us. Mm. Hare Krishna, dear devotees, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you for joining today's call. So today Guru Maharaj will continue to enlighten us on the topic, uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's instructions to Sanatana Goswami on pure devotional service from Sri Chaitanya Chaitamrita Madhya Leela, chapter 22, verse 8. Mm -hmm. uh, should I share? Mm. Yes, bring up the verse. Mm -hmm. Okay, good morning. Thank you. Just two minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh. Hare Krishna. So, as was announced, it's a continuation from the chapter uh, devotional service, pure devotional service, Madhya Leela, chapter 22, and Lord Chaitanya's instructions or guide uh, instructions on the pure devotional service to Sri Sanatana Goswami. Swamsam Vibhanam Sambhupe Anadistara Ananta Vaikuta Brahmande Karenam Vihara Translation Translation Oh, sorry, Guru Maharaj. Yeah. Krishna ex expands himself in many forms. Some of them are personal expansions, and some are separate expansions. Thus, he performs pastimes both in the spiritual and in the material worlds. <laughs> the spiritual worlds are the Vaikuntha planets, and the material universe is all are the Brahmandas, gigantic globes governed by Lord Brahma. Next verse. Swam mm -hmm. Savistara Chatur Vyuha Avatara Gana Vivinam Sajiva Tara Sakite Ganana. Expansions of his personal self, like the quadruple manifestations of Shankarshana, Pradyumna. Aniruddha and Vasudeva descend as incarnations from Vaikuntha to this material world. The separated expansions are the living entities. Although they are expansions of Krishna, they are counted amongst his different potencies, Sri Prabhupada's purple. The personal expansions are known as Vishnu Tattva, and the separate expansions are known as Jiva Tattva. Although the jivas, living entities, are parts and parcels of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they are still counted amongst his multipotencies. This is fully described by Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita 7.5. Aparayamiti tvanyam prakriti virime param jiva bhutam mahabaho yeyedam daryate jagat Besides his inferior nature of mighty Amarjum, there is another superior energy of mind which comprises the living entities who are exploiting the resources of this material inferior nature. Hmm. Although the living entities are Krishna's parts and parcel, they are Prakriti, not Purusha. Sometimes Prakriti, a living entity, attempts to imitate the activities of the Purusha. Due to a poor form of knowledge, the living entity's condition in this material world claim to be God. They are thus illusioned. A living entity cannot be on the level of Vishnu Tattva or the personality of Godhead at any stage. Therefore, it is ludicrous for a living entity to claim to be God. 
advanced spiritualists would never accept such a thing. Such claims are made to cheat ordinary foolish people. The Krishna conscious movement declares war against these bogus incarnations. incarnations. The bogus propaganda put out by people claiming to be God has killed God consciousness all over the world. Members of the Krishna conscious movement must be very alert to defy these rascals who present presently misleading the world. One such rascal known as Pondrak appeared before Lord Krishna and the Lord immediately killed him. Of course, those who are Krishna servants cannot kill such imitations gods, but they should try their best to defeat them through the evidence of Shastra, authentic knowledge received through the disciplic successions. Omigyan timidandasya gyanajana salakaya chaksu ummilitam yena tasmai sri gurave namaha. Sri Chaitanya Manobistam Stapti Tamyena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swakadati Tan Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Pasjatya De Satarine Vansha Kalpa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Bebhacha Paditanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Srivasadi Gaur Bhaktivinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare um, uh, go back to the verse again. <laughs> um, not that one, number nine. One we just read. Number nine. Number nine. Yeah. So we hear about the different expansions of the Lord. Advaita Machudi Anadi Anamta Rupa Madhyam Purosh. Purushona Vayoganam Chave Desha Dula Bhavadur Lamatta Bhakti Govinda Mari Purusham Tamaham Bhajami. Uh, just like there are so many waves in the ocean, if one were to sit on the shore of the ocean and try to count the waves, one would be unable to maintain that uh, that uh, <clears throat> activity because the waves just keep coming and coming and coming you know, as the ocean keeps hitting the shore with its waters. So the expansions of the Supreme Personality of God and his different manifestations and incarnations are unlimitedly uncountable. It's not possible to even begin to count. Sometimes we use the example, if one could, if possible, one great scientist could count all the grains on the, all the beaches and all of, in all of creation, he would not even come close to the amount of incarnations that the Lord manifests. As the Lord is unlimited, his incarnations are also of the same scope, unlimited. And we get a little in, 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 indication of some of the manifestations of the incarnations here. The quadruple manifestations, Sankarsana, Pradyumna, Haniruddha, and Vasudeva, uh, they are from the spiritual world. They are called the Chatur Vyuha. Chatur means four, four manifestations that uh, are the essential principle that expand into the uh, Mahavishnu, Shirodakshay Vishnu, Kar Karvadakshay Vishnu, which make up the creative uh, incarnations of the Lord for the sake of bringing about the universes. And then we have the living entities. The living entities are called Vibhinamsa. 
Vivinamsa means unlimited or expansive. And that's the jivas, that's us. <laughs> we are of the same quality as Krishna. And because that principle is there, uh, uh, people who want to exploit that principle say that we are God because we are of the same quality. The son may be the same quality as the father, but the son is not the father, nor can the son ever become the father. He can become his own father, but not, he cannot become his father's father. So in the same way, the living entities are pure spiritual energy, but in the material world, that spiritual energy has been covered. And uh, all living entities are of that nature. So there are a class of spiritualists who like to claim that they are this, of the same nature as God and therefore they are God. But our understanding is they are of the same nature, but in different quantities. Just like a drop of ocean, drop of water, is of the same quality as the ocean. It has liquidity. It has maybe salt also. But you can't do the same thing with the drop as you can with the ocean. If you try to swim in the drop, it's not possible. But you can swim in the ocean. You can't wash anything with a drop of water, but you can wash many things with an ocean of water. So in the same way, the living entities have that same quality, but not in the same quantity. So therefore, there is a similarity, but also a concomitant difference that makes up the relationship between the Supreme Lord and the living entities. Both are spiritual. And because both are spiritual, the eternal relationship exists. <laughs> We as living entities cannot enjoy anything that is different from our nature. Um, we cannot enjoy matter because matter is not our nature. Because we are covered with matter and identify with matter as being uh, the self, the living entities struggle hard to try to enjoy in this material world, thinking that there is enjoyment by manipulating the material energy in such a way as to facilitate some kind of gain through that manipulation. And that will goes on as life in the material world. Everyone is trying to adjust material energy to make it work according to their plans, thinking that their plans once fulfilled will bring about satisfaction and happiness. But because we are contrary to that energy, we cannot enjoy that energy or become part of the enjoyment of that energy. So, um, and material energy has no life itself. It is simply jada. Jada means it has, it's lifeless. What gives life to the material energy is the presence of the spirit soul within the material energy. And these are particles of living entities that are all pervasive. There's living entities everywhere. Just like we're sitting in our room, we may be with one or two other people, but how many living entities are actually in your room at the time you're there? You can maybe see two of the same species, but there are uncountable living entities floating in the air known as germs or various types of bacteria or various types of hidden living entities in different corners in your home. <laughs> you can't even see them, or sometimes you can't see them, but the number is uncountable. So the whole, the whole material world is permeated with living beings on different levels. And the smallest, as it's explained in the Brahma Samhita, is the Indra Gopa germ which is so tiny that even certain microscopes cannot even pick up this germ, it's so tiny. 
but it exists and it's a living entity and it's part and parcel of Krishna. So the material energy is quite diverse and quite filled with living beings. Now, those who try to exploit that, as Prabhupada gives a lot of credence to this um, uh, example of how a uh, person's thinking that because I'm spirit, I am the supreme spirit. Because I am, uh, I am a citizen, I am, therefore I am the president. <laughs> It's like saying the same thing. <laughs> uh, of course, that is ridiculous. Uh, Prabhupada uses the word ludicrous, which takes the word ridiculous to another level of ridiculousness. So, um, but in order to take advantage of that principle and expand it into the wrong way, we have people who present themselves as incarnations of God. Uh, just like um, I, uh, when I was in the New Vrindavan community uh, many years ago, I think this was back in the 1980s, early part of the 80s, um, there was one person who came into our community and uh, he was making the claim that he was Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. So, um, of course, none of the devotees in the community took him seriously, but he continued with his, with his program. And of course, it became disturbing after a while. So we asked him to leave and um, he agreed and then he left. And uh, we told him that Lord Jesus Christ is very much accustomed to do austerities so you should walk. <laughs> so we didn't give him any rides. We just told him, here's the road, go. So he was compliant. Right after that, when he was, after he left, I had to leave the same day and I was driving in my vehicle. At that time I was driving a Ford van, traveling around and, and doing and preaching in different places. And, um, uh, so he was along the road and he decided that he would hitchhike trying to get a ride. So I decided to stop for him and give him a ride. So he jumped into the cab and sat in the passenger seat. And then uh, somehow we got up in a conversation and I said to him, uh, well, you're saying you're Lord Jesus Christ, but we know that there is a way to prove that that in the Christian tradition, they say that anyone who claims to be Jesus Christ must show the stigmata. The stigmata are the marks of crucifixion on the hands of the Lord. And so um, I said, if you're Jesus Christ, let me see the stigmata. So he flashed his hands really fast in front of my face. And then I said, well, I didn't see anything. He said, uh, and he acted very arrogantly, and he said, I only show it once, that's all. So I thought, this is an impossible situation here. So I thought maybe he should walk. <laughs> so I stopped the van and asked him to leave, and he did. And that was the last time we met him. And then I uh, came across some statistics that in the year 1985, there was a survey taken in the United States of America. And in that survey, they had counted 200, I'm sorry, 2,500 persons claiming to be Lord Jesus Christ. 2,500, small number. And now how many people claim to be Krishna or an incarnation of Krishna? That number is even greater. <laughs> Hundreds and thousands have come and gone like that. And every once in a while you hear some about some bogus incarnation who yeah, somehow or other has some mystic power. Mystic powers can be developed by practice. It doesn't require, it requires some 
some austerity and some training, well, one can develop this mystic powers. And uh, so they use this mystic power to attract followers and then uh, become very, what we say, popular as being an incarnation of God who's come. I remember I was in America doing Sankirtan and there was one uh, so-called, uh, he wasn't, he never claimed to be an incarnation of God, but he claimed to be a great powerful yogi who started a spiritual movement. <laughs> and so he became somewhat popular in the United States of America, had a large community in the state of Oregon, and he had, you know, hundreds of acres of land. He had 32 Rolls Royces, Rolls Royce cars. He had so many uh, girlfriends. <laughs> and I remember um, he was uh, also got caught up in tax evasion in the United States, so they decided to de deport him out of the country. So the night before, he had made a speech, and they recorded that speech, and they, uh, he uh, had said something that angered me so much that uh, I was besides myself in anger. And, he's, and the speech, what he said was printed in the front page of uh, a newspaper called the, the uh, what is that? Uh, that newspaper that's all over the United States. What is it called? Uh, those of you in the US, you know that name in the newspaper. It's not a local paper. It's, it's, it's a daily paper that's printed all over and distributed throughout all the United States, all these states. Does anybody remember the name of that newspaper? Is the USA Today, I think, or? Yeah, yeah, you got it, USA Today, yeah. USA, thank you, uh, Nittai Nataraj, USA Today. So it was a widely read newspaper and always had interesting articles, comparatively speaking. So I happened to get a copy of the newspaper that day and there he was, front page, his picture was there. And there was a caption, which was a statement he had made the night before in a lecture. And in that, what he said was, the greatest illusion for mankind is the idea of God. He was saying that God is the greatest illusion for mankind. So I remember becoming quite disturbed by that. <laughs> so much so that I, my whole day was just, <laughs> of course, now when I hear these things and I, I can expect them from such persons, but in those days it was different. As Prabhupada said, we should, we should meet these people and challenge them and defeat them by Shastric evidence like that. So I was eager to somehow or other try and find this person, but just the next day, it's interesting. The next day, he was rounded up by the United States government, put into a temporary jail in North Carolina, and then uh, shipped out of the United States back to India, where he originated from. He was from Pune. So, uh, yeah, that was the end of the bogus yogi. And later on, he died. <laughs> And so you see, there are so many who want to take the position of Krishna. The fact that the living entity comes to the material world to imitate Krishna and want to become like Krishna. And, but the living entity is who he is. He's part and parcel of Krishna. And that's one of the expansions of Krishna called Vimanansa. So sometimes we ask the question, what is the purpose of Krishna expanding himself into innumerable living entities. Does it have a purpose? Krishna has his eternal uh, Vishnu Tattva, not Vishnu Tattva, but eternally liberated souls 
in the spiritual world who never fall to the material world. And many of them are his eternal associates like Mother Yasoda, Nanda Maharaj, many of the cowherd boys, gopis like that. Why does Krishna expand himself into innumerable living entities? And that is to exchange loving affairs with each and every living entity. So he creates these living entities, which are parts of his own self, to and expands in them into individuals, just to have loving, loving, loving exchanges with, because the whole pra, the whole process of life is to receive love and to give love, because love is the nature of the soul, and the soul fulfills its loving propensity in the in relationship to the supreme soul and when that is there then there is unlimited success for the living entity and krishna enjoys being in loving relationships with each and every part and parcel so then you might also say we well, he has so many other living entities who are not of the category of vivinansa why does he have to create the vivinances to have love in relationships? And then we can go to one verse in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. It's um, chapter number seven. If you could go to that verse, it's Adi Lila, not Madhya, Adi Lila, chapter seven, verse 166. Mm -hmm. Okay, Can you do that, Suda? Yes, Guru This is interesting. Something people ask, well, we had, a, I remember this was a very heated discussion. What is the purpose of the living entities? If Krishna has so many eternal associates in the spiritual world who never fall down. Um, um, sorry, Guru Maharaj, verses 167. 166, Adi Leela. Chapter seven. Okay. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I think that's the verse. If it's not, I have an alternative, that, which I, which is the other one. I think it is. So it's either one of the two. Okay. Let's see what the verse says. Uh, let's see. No, it's not that one. Let's go to verse 116, what? not 166. 116. Same chapter. 7, 116. This is interesting because it, it talks about the, 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 the. Yeah, this is the verse. Ishwar Tattva Yena Jwal. Oops, come, come, come back to the sentence. Ishwara Ish Ishware Ishreva Ish Ishwar Ishwarera Tattva Yena Jwalita Jwalana Jivera Surupa Yache Spulingera Kana. The Lord is like a great blazing fire and the living entities are like small sparks in that fire now here's the answer although sparks and a big fire are both fire and both have the power to burn the burning power of the fire and that of the spark is not the same why should one artificially try to become like the big fire although by constitution he is like a small spark is due to ignorance. One should have therefore understand that neither the Supreme Personality of Godhead nor do the spark-like living entities have anything to do with matter. But when the spiritual spark comes in contact with the material world, its fiery qualities are extinguished. This is the petition of the, of the living entity. Because they are in touch with the material world, the spiritual quality is almost dead. That's us. Because these spiritual sparks are also Krishna's part and parcel, as the Lord states in Bhagavad Gita, Amai Vamsa. 
they can revive their religious position by getting free from material contact. This is pure philosophical entity. In the Bhagavad Gita, the spiritual sparks are declared as sanatana, eternal. Therefore, the material energy maya cannot affect their constitutional position. Okay. Okay, here's the answer. Someone may argue, why is there a need to create the spiritual sparks? That's an argument. The answer can be given in this way. Since the absolute truth of Godhead is omnipotent, he has both unlimited and limited potencies. Here you go. This is the meaning of omnipotent. To be omnipotent, he must not he must have not only unlimited potencies, but limited potencies also. Thus, to exhibit his omnipotence, he displays both. The living entities are endowed with limited potency, although they are part of the Lord. The Lord displays the spiritual world by his unlimited potencies, whereas the limited potencies, whereby his limited potencies, the material world is displayed. And then we read that verse from that other, uh, we read this verse in the other verse also. Yeah. So uh, therefore, this is an interesting point because God is all powerful. He has both limited and unlimited potencies. Interesting. And we are the limited potencies. Why are we limited? Because we get covered by that other energy, which is known as the material energy which is called the inferior energy. There are three uh, principal energies of the Lord. One is called Bahiranga Shakti, and that is the material world. Uh, that is the material energy. Antaranga Shakti is the spiritual energy, and Tatasta Shakti is the living entities in the material world. So, Antaranga is the pure spiritual energy. Bahiranga is the material energy. As it says here, Aparayamiti Tvasnyan Prakriti Me Prakriti Vidime Param Jiva Bhuta Mahabhayo Yeye Dham Jayate Diga. That's just the inferior energy. But then there's the superior energy. Um, and well, this this describes the actually the superior energy and the material energy is described in the verse before that. Mumira panalo bayu kamano buddhu evacha ahankar itiyam me prakriti vidi me param. So. Uh, the living entities in the material world are tatasta. Tatasta means marginal. They can go towards the spiritual or they can go towards the material, either way. But they're covered by the material, so the process of uncovering is devotional service to the Lord, which brings the spiritual energy in contact with the jiva which awakens its pure spiritual energy, which destroys the coverings of the material energy and the spiritual and the living entity is back again in its pure spiritual constitution where life is eternal, knowledge is complete on all levels and one is uh, unlimitedly joyful. Um, this is our actual nature. When we speak about who we are, what is our characteristics? We have three natures. We don't take birth. We don't die. We have unlimited knowledge, and that knowledge is not coming from anything outside of this, uh, our, ourselves. We have that knowledge within us, and we have unlimited happiness, un unlimited joyfulness. That is our nature. But in the material world, eternity is covered over by the temporary nature of the material energy where everything appears, goes through six changes and ultimately disintegrates and dies. Uh, knowledge is covered in such so that we actually have to learn things. There's nothing to learn. Everything is there. All you have to do is bring it out. 
you have full knowledge of everything, both material and spiritual. And you also have full knowledge, at least partial knowledge of Krishna. But that partial knowledge is enough to awaken our attraction for Krishna. And we have unlimited joy. And these are the three principal energies that manifest themselves, both in the material and in the spiritual world. And from these energies, especially the spiritual energy, there are limited, unlimited varieties of, of functions of the spiritual energy in this, both the spiritual and material worlds. So we get a little indication how great Krishna is when we hear about his unlimited energies and how they work in different ways to fulfill all his desires. And each of those energies are also potent. Potent in the sense that they are conscious. They're not simply uh, dead energies like here. Like what is our energy in the material world? Our possessions. We have our paper money, that's our energy. We have our house, that's our energy. We have our material possessions, these are considered the energies of the living entity in the material world. But they're jetta, they are dead, they have no life. They're not sentient. But Krishna's energies are all sentient because Krishna is the complete fulfillment of all activities on the personal level. So everything comes from Krishna is also personal. It's also personal and it has consciousness. So we get a little indication from these verses of the greatness of Krishna and the position of us, the living entities. So we can stay under the cover of the material energy for unlimited lifetimes and simply struggle with that energy. Mitche maya dabase, kacho beshe, kacho habubububai, chief Krishna dase, vishwash, koganara dukanai. Bhakti Vinod Kaur explains that and from the highest planet in the material world down to the lowest, the living entity transmigrates from one body to another, life after life, visiting various types of species and in various types of uh, material uh, dwellings. In the material world, there are 14 planetary systems, seven up, and seven down. We are considered to be in the upper planetary system, but the lowest of the upper planetary systems. You have, uh, you have, uh, let's see, you have Satyaloka, you have, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, Satyaloka, and then you have, uh, well, actually I'll read it. <laughs> Planetary systems are, uh, there are seven up and seven down. Let me see here. Uh, we have Mahaloka, Janaloka, Tapaloka, and then you go into the realms of the demigods, which are below those planets. That's Swargaloka, and you have Indra's abode, and below that. And then you have Bhuva Loka, which is the planet of the ghostly beings. They're in the higher planetary systems. And below that, you have the humans. That's us. We're of the lowest of the, of the seven higher planetary system that is called Bhur Loka. Om Bhur Bhuva. So Bhuva, Bhuva, Bhur Bhuva. We are Bhuva Loka and Bhur Loka is one step up. That's the ghostly beings. And then you go to Patal. Uh, uh, Tala Tala, Atala, Satala, Sutala, Tala Tala, Patala. These are the lower planet tests and whether we have lower level lives of human beings in more ferocious species of life. <laughs> so this makes up the material world and there are 8,400,000 species all have a particular karma that causes them to take birth on a particular planet with a particular body, with a particular mindset due to their activities and desires. So if we simply change our desire, 
we can change our activity. Sometimes people try to change their activity and think that by changing their activity, they change their desire. But that doesn't, that doesn't work. You have to change your desire. And then when you adopt an activity that's in line with that desire, then that, then, then that transformation is complete. So we have the desire to ultimately to get out of the material world, to go back to the spiritual world. And in order to do that, then we change our activities into devotional service. So the more we engage in devotional service, the more we are purifying our material consciousness and destroying it and awaking our spiritual consciousness, which is our real consciousness. Uh, this material world is like a dream. As Srila Prabhupada said, this is a dream. And he used a nice example. And it's also mentioned in the Bhagavatam that when you go to bed at night or you lay down to sleep, you go into a state of dreaming. And in that state of dreaming, you're also experiencing something that's happening. Although it's a dream state, it appears to be real during the dream, dream experience. When you wake up, then you reflect it was just a dream. Sometimes it's a good dream by material standards, and sometimes it's a horrible dream by material standards, but it's a, it's a dream. Why? Because that body that we see within our dream state is not us. It's a reflection of our image of the, of the actual waking body that we take into the dream state. So that waking body state is another, another manifestation of the dream state because it is something that's created by the material energy and it's not us. So therefore, uh, the difference between waking consciousness and dreaming consciousness is just two levels of dreams. We're dreaming that we're a woman, we're dreaming that we're a man, we're dreaming that we're old or young, we're dreaming I'm from this country, I'm from that country. See, these are all dreams. And therefore, Bhakti Vinod gives the Jeev Jago, Jeev Jago, Gaura Chandra Bole, Kota Nija Jayomaya, Pisa Chira Kole. Wake up. <laughs> Wake up from this dream state and actually understand your actual identity and then act in, on that identity. Uh, understanding our ident identity comes in two phases. One, to understand who we're not first, and then start to understand who we are. That makes the complete understanding of the transformation of the knowledge. Who we're not is anything connected to this material world, and who we are is our we have an eternal loving relationship with Krishna in the spiritual world. We have a transcendental form. We have activities. We have relationships, just like everything is here on this planet. In, in the material form, in the spiritual world, it's there in its pristine, pure, uncontaminated spiritual essence. And that is our existence. And so um, to get to that stage, one has to change their desire from material to spiritual and then act on that desire which is the process of devotional service. Well, that is the goal of devotional service is, is to regain our relationship with Krishna in the spiritual world. And we use the word regain, it means that's something that we have lost. <laughs> We've lost we, we're in this material world and we are trying to be happy artificially, which is not possible. Okay, so these are interesting statements and you get a little understanding of the complexity of Krishna's existence as he manifests himself through his different expansions and his different potencies. And it's interesting, it says the living entity in the material world is both an expansion of Krishna as Vivedansa and it's also one of his potencies. So the living entity has two categories of of, ex, uh, of definition, one is a potency and one is an expansion like that. Okay, so we'll stop there and uh, we'll go back to the main screen. And, uh,
And uh, we ask the devotees, the, the host has to encourage the devotees to please turn on your cameras. And then we can get into a discussion. <laughs> okay. Hare Krishna. Uh, thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much for the very nice class on this different expansions of Lord and his uh, potencies. Um, uh, you spoke about like uh, Lord's personal expansions, like um, uh, Sankarshana, Niruddha, and, and you spoke about like uh, separated expansions with jivas, we living entities. So, and you also told like living entities, they are like uh, same quality but like uh, um, Krishna but not like uh, in uh, quantity quantity they are not same yeah, thank you and also you spoke about Guru Maharaj, how people claim to be God mm. and um, uh, and how why they claim to be God it's because due to their ignorance uh, due to their attachment to the uh, material energy thank you much. And, uh, okay thank you very much yeah thank you very much uh, Thank you for... We this. have only yes. five cameras out of 19 people. Yes. What happened to the other... Yeah, devotees, uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, comments, realizations, uh, please go ahead and uh, okay. ask questions. Um, That's quite, also, now, I, now I can see the audience and now I'm inspired. Thank you very much. It's, I'm asking that for my benefit, so... <laughs> When I see all the smiling faces of the devotees, then uh, we get enthusiastic about discussions. <laughs> yeah, Guru Maharaj, Raj okay. Prabhu has a question. Um, okay, Raj. Yeah. Hey, Ivana, turn on, your, turn on your camera, Ivana. Radha Vinodini, Madhavananda. Please accept my humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to Self Maharaj. Yes, I was thinking when you said uh, you said that we are limited, and then you described a few of the three qualities that we have. Uh, obviously, we don't display those qualities when we're in the material world, but you're talking about qualities uh, when we're outside the spirit, outside the material world, in the spiritual world. I was thinking, like, you particularly named a few qualities, but the Lord has so, so many qualities. And I was thinking, if we're, if we're, and then you, you also just said at one point that, uh, like, a drop of water has the same qualities as the ocean, but not in the same quantity. So I'm thinking, does that not mean that we have all of the, say, 64 qualities of the Lord, but in minute quantity well, as that, well? No, that, there is also, a, that question comes up. It's also qualified in the Nectar of Devotion by Srila Rupa Goswami, mm -hmm. saying that there we have 50 of the principal qualities of Krishna, which are most of his characteristics but in minute quantity. And then there are five more for persons like such as Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma. There's five more for the Narayan expansions of Krishna. And then there's four qualities that are exclusive for Krishna, which no other expansion or incarnation has. So Krishna has, Krishna is unique in the sense that they, he is the source of everything else, and he has unique characteristics that are not found in others. So that's mentioned in the Nectar Devotion. So in proportion, we have 78% of the qualities of Krishna. Uh, Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva have 84. Uh, Lord Narayan has 96. And uh, Krishna is the Sunam Bonam, he is the complete <laughs> but how much of that do we have whilst we're in the material world uh, when in the material world we can only exhibit some living entities can exhibit more than others depending on their their power of intelligence and their ability 
and to uh, awaken their spiritual nature. But it is, uh, again, because of being covered by a material body, there is also a limitation there. When you when one resumes their position in the spiritual world, then the qualities come back and forth. We hear Thank what can we know. what can we do here? You know, mm. we are we are somewhat uh, captured or restricted. That's a better word, restricted by the material energy. Mm. But when we look at where we are now and where we could possibly be, there's a lot to, there's a lot to gain. So even though there is limitations, still we could go much farther than where we are now. <laughs> because consciousness is pristine, it's pure. It's like water that comes from a pure stream where there's no debris, dirt, or leaves or anything on it, it's pure crystal sparkling water. And when it settles, you can see down to it. There's a place in, uh, in Rishikesh, in the Himalayas area, it's called Lakshmanjula. I don't know if devotees have been there, maybe you have. But you can look down into the water and it's about four or five feet deep, maybe a little more. And you can see the rocks on the bottom clearly. It's like, a, it's like a translucent green color. And the water is so clear that there is no blockage. You can see clearly what's on the bottom. So our consciousness in its natural state is like that. And it's also given that title pristine. Pristine means without any contamination. As Soon as we touch the material energy, and then, then the contaminated consciousness comes and then it unfolds into various levels until it gets to a certain stage and then we exist on that stage. That's nice. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Yeah. Everyone's pure spiritual energy. Okay, any other questions or comments? Yeah, thank you, Prabhu, for the very nice question. Uh, devotees, any more questions, realizations, uh, please? Lalita, Lalita Tangi Radha Devi. Please accept my humble obeisances, Maharaj, or Guru Shachina Prabhupada. Uh, I, thank you so much for this. Um, I mean, it's like a crash course of the whole philosophy of uh, how the material world came, why we are limited, what is dreaming condition. I never, although I read so many times, I never could relate to the present material body being like a dream. And you explain nicely that how we have a dream body. And since this is not our identity, this is also a dream. So thank you so much. It is like uh, you are diving deep into the ocean of Srila Prabhupada's purpose which is like an ocean and you're picking up the pearls and giving it to us here it is. But I hope we know the value of those pearls and we try to invite that. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's good to know what we're not so we can focus on more of who we are. If, mm, Knowing the positive understanding of our identity and our relationship with Krishna is the sunam bonam of knowledge. But what helps us to get to that stage is to cut away the illusions that have accumulated over time due to the association with the material energy. We have to cut, therefore, when Prabhupada first made his back to Godhead, magazine, he said, um, um, let me see, uh, uh, Godhead is light, Godhead is light, go ahead. The science is darkness. The science is darkness. And so he would explain that we have to know the, diff the difference between is what is light and what is darkness and be able to distinguish like that. 
Otherwise, we may take the darkness to be a, a feature of the light. <laughs> and that happens when you see something that has some value within the material energy, you also may connect it to something spiritual. What is that value? It may be something in the mode of goodness, but the mode of goodness is also uh, within the three modes of material nature. Thank you so much, Maharaj. I have to uh, re-listen to your class because uh, every line is like a, like a Vedanta Sutra is everything put in a capsule. So like that way, every line you spoke has so much uh, a philosophy and realization behind it. Thanks. I can give you a very simple um, uh, explanation how you can understand you're not this body. And, it's, and it happens during the time, time when we're dreaming, when we're sleeping. When you're sleeping and you're somehow in a dream state, sometimes, many times, you see yourself in the dream. And you're witnessing what's happening to, yourself, to you in the dream. Or you're actually participating in the dream. It's almost like watching a movie about yourself. So then again, you have to make a distinction, or you, there is a distinction already made. Describing that distinction means there is that dream body that's acting itself out in the dream state, and then there, there's the per, per, person who's witnessing it. So the, per, the person who's witnessing it is you, the soul. And the person in the dream state is your conception of yourself as it's known in the material realm. So in the dream, you, you do actually divide yourself into two. Many times, not all, but many times. So who's, who's, who's watching and who's being watched? <laughs> Which one is the real one? <laughs> Right. So um, the one being watched is the material uh, identity and the one who's watching is the soul. Yeah, the soul. Yeah, because the soul is pure consciousness. The mind is in a certain state of dreaming, that's all. <laughs> the mind goes through three stages, Waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. When you're in deep sleep, you're also dreaming, but you have no recollection of that because the consciousness is on such a low level of existence that there's no awareness. <laughs> That's when consciousness is completely buried. And that's called deep sleep or sound sleep. Sometimes they call it restful sleep. <laughs> But in the material world, we're also sleeping to the to our identity, our spiritual identity. So therefore, to use the analogy of a dream is actually quite appropriate. But Jeev Jago, Bhaktivinoda course says Jeev Jago, Jeev Jago, Gola Chanda Gole, Kota Nidra. Jayo Maya Pisa Chita Kone, wake up. And what does he say? Enechi Asadi Maya Nasi Badalagi Hari Nama Maha Mantra Lao Tumi Magi. Here's the alarm clock <laughs> chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. It's the waking, the wake up. Don't push the snooze button. <laughs> I, I could relate to this more uh, because today I had a very uh, I had a dream that I could observe myself and I was doing the most abominable thing and then I was thinking up and I, I got up and I said what is that where is that coming from and so I was disturbed by that and now you are explaining nicely about uh, this is so nice Maharaj thank you it, it uh, I, mean, I, also, I, I also had a dream today that I didn't like. 
So I ran out of it. I got out of it. <laughs> my, my intelligence was such was geared in such a way that, uh-oh, I don't want to be here. So I just got, I woke up. <laughs> Sometimes we get stuck. If we like what we're dreaming, then we don't, we don't have a desire to wake up. But if we don't like it, then that, that, that triggers the waking process and we get out of it. Sometimes with difficulty, but it happens. So we have to be careful what we desire because that leaves impressions on the mind. And then those impressions lead us in a certain direction. So the whole idea is just to think of Krishna <laughs> and focus on Krishna. We were speaking today in today's class that one of the ways to meditate on Krishna is simply sit before your deity or a beautiful picture of, of the Lord and simply gaze at that beautiful form of the Lord. It's called ikshanam. Ikshanam is another form of worship where there is no actual service, simply uh, observing or meditating upon the, the visual form of the Lord. And one's consciousness actually becomes attracted through, uh, and that's, that's actually very helpful in keeping our mind focused on Krishna. That's why we have so many pictures. We put pictures in our houses and these pictures remind us of the beautiful forms of the Lord. Or we see the beautiful deity in the temple we, we, we go to the temple and we come back to our daily activities and we reflect on that, that image that we saw in the temple throughout the day. That's Krishna consciousness. Thank you, Mother. Hey. Thank you. Would anyone else like to ask a question or speak something. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Nisha, Gurmaj, for the very nice class. Um, as Gurmaj, you mentioned, this is like um, you know, our nature, like, you know, explained about like, you know, unlimited knowledge, unlimited happiness, but it's since it's covered, we are trying to educate ourselves, but that is actually naturally it should. It's a process. It's a process. As your Prabhupada said, it's a gradual process. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing is, don't, don't take any detours. <laughs> when we take detours and go back to again developing our material consciousness, and then we um, minimize the, the the gains that we've made on the spiritual level. So try to keep yourself connected to Krishna always, somehow or other. Okay, so. Um, I do have another program tonight on the outside, so I'm about ready to go. So thank you all for coming on board. And we'll continue with this chapter because it gets more and more interesting as the chapter you know, unveils itself. Uh, these are nice teachings by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Okay. My obeisances to all devotees, so nice to see you, instead of just looking at a blank screen for the last two and a half, one and a half years. I see Nitai Nataraj is cooking. Cooking, yeah, cooking chapati. Hare <laughs> Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> My obeisances to everyone. Panchakopa to Vascha, Krita Sindhu, Deva Cha, Titana, Pavane, Bion, Vaishnava, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai. Jai. Shri Raghu Dev Ki Jai. Haribo, Sonia, 
Zomodatri and Manjuality appeared at the, the final moment to give birth. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. <laughs> what to say? Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you soon, right? Your uh, week. One week. No, no. I'm sorry, but I can't come because of the quarantine. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Not possible. Yeah, because. Uh, I'm to to out of Switzerland. I thought I, I will come, but on the ticket and everything. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, so Madatri is brokenhearted. <laughs> yes, me too. No, yes. <laughs> oh. Okay, thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Wherever you are, stay safe and healthy. And as they say, Satatam Kirtayan Toman, always remember Krishna. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. All the best. Thank you, devotees. I'll end the call here. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna.